Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is a pro-revenge story. Gazumping occurs when an agent or seller accepts an offer you make to buy a property at an agreed price, but the property is sold to someone else. This usually happens when the vendor sells the property for a higher amount. This happened five years ago and it remains one of the proudest moments of my life. My best friend Sarah and her husband Mike have four kids together. They lived in an expensive coastal town and rented an old three-bedroom house for $600 per week. The house was very run down with a decrepit kitchen and problematic plumbing, but it was all they could afford at the time. Still, they made it work. The owner was a kind, elderly woman named Mrs. Thompson who was extremely wealthy and very fond of Sarah. She froze the rent for three years and promised to let them buy the house once they had saved enough to get a loan from the bank. You're such good tenants, Mrs. Thompson had told Sarah. I'd love to see you own this place someday. As she had helped other people in a similar way, they knew they could trust her, and so they saved every cent they could. It took them three years, but they finally told her they were ready. Two days later, Mrs. Thompson passed away before anything was put in writing. Enter the new owners, Mrs. Thompson's three children. Each extremely wealthy in their own right, they inherited a huge portfolio of properties. When they first spoke to Sarah and Mike, they assured them that the sale would still go through, but they would have to wait until probate had settled. Don't worry, the eldest son, Richard, had said. We'll honor our mother's wishes. Just be patient. Confident, Sarah and Mike started making some changes to the place. They started by stripping wallpaper, painting, and making plans. Finally, probate was settled and the owners agreed to go ahead with the sale for the previously agreed price. Sarah and Mike applied for the loan, but to their shock, it was refused. The owners had raised the asking price by $120,000 without telling Sarah and Mike. To make things even worse, the house would be put on the open market. In seven days, there would be an open house, and with the market the way it was, it would probably sell immediately. Sarah called me, her voice trembling. They've completely betrayed us, Lisa. What are we going to do? Sarah and Mike were devastated. They might be able to borrow enough, but it would take longer than a week to get. To make matters worse, property prices had soared recently, and rents had gone up a lot while theirs had been frozen. Not only were Sarah and Mike going to struggle to get the money, but if the place was sold to someone else and they were asked for a higher rent or were evicted, it would be nearly impossible to find an affordable place with more than two bedrooms. I was scared for my friends, but I was also incandescently angry. Those greedy individuals were some of the wealthiest people in the town. They were screwing over a struggling family for less than $40,000 each. They didn't need the money. It was pure greed, and it was obvious that they'd always planned to do this. So while Sarah and Mike scrambled to come up with the money, I started plotting. I looked up advice on what helps to make a sale. We needed to make the place as undesirable as possible without making Sarah and Mike look like bad tenants. Uncluttered, we moved all the furniture in from the walls, added some extra furniture and borrowed ornaments, and hung a load of motorcycle memorabilia on the walls. The place felt smaller. Smell. Sarah boiled a head of cabbage on the stove and we sprayed ammonia around the front and back doors. Because it smells like all the neighborhood cats had been marking their territory. We also poured two dozen rotten eggs down the drain to make it smell like sewer gas. Neighborhood. We obtained a moldy old couch and dumped it in the front yard of the neighbor across the road, with permission, of course. Are you sure this will work? Mike asked, eyeing the couch skeptically. Trust me, I replied. Every little bit helps. Neighborhood X2. We started calling friends for help. Anybody with a loud and crappy car was asked to do a few laps in front of the block during the open day. The street was unusually busy that day. Everyone we knew found a reason to drive by. It was practically rush hour. Neighborhood X3, we called our mates from the rugby club. A big portion of our club are very large men. The next door neighbor set up a barbecue in their front yard and we offered free food and cheap beer. They came on motorcycles wearing their roughest gear. There was quite a crowd. Hey Lisa! shouted Tom, one of the rugby players. Great party! We should do this every weekend! I grinned and shouted back, Absolutely! The louder the better! A lot of people showed up for the open day. Quite a few were in and out within minutes. One lady sat in her car and watched the party next door before driving away. The one man who stayed any length of time was brave enough to start up a conversation with someone leaving the party. He asked if they were often there and was told every couple of weeks or so they have an after-party morning and the party the night before was three doors up. 
The party goer also helpfully mentioned the troublesome drains that are always getting blocked by tree roots and stinking up the place. The potential buyer left without making an offer. So Sarah and Mike were the only ones to make an offer. They still had to pay more than they'd planned, but not as much as the greedy owners wanted. Sarah and Mike signed the papers and paid the deposit that day. So when the brave buyer put in an offer of $50,000 more than Sarah and Mike, there was nothing the owners could do about it. Strict anti-gazumping laws. We did it! Sarah exclaimed, hugging me tightly. I can't believe it actually worked! I would have loved to see the owners' faces when they found out. Justice had been served and Sarah and Mike finally had a place to call their own. The next one is an entitled people's story. My family's been living on this beautiful piece of land for generations. It's not huge, but it's ours. Or at least, it was supposed to be. This whole mess started when my great-aunt Karen decided she knew better than everyone else about what should happen to our family property. Now, I should probably explain a bit about our family situation. My grandparents had this nice plot of land, about 10 acres, with a main house and a smaller guest house. They had two kids, my mom and her sister Karen. Mom always loved the land and wanted to keep it in the family. Karen, on the other hand, couldn't wait to get out and move to the big city. When my grandparents passed away, they left the property to both my mom and Karen, thinking they'd figure out what to do with it together. Boy, were they wrong. Mom wanted to keep it as is, maybe fix up the guest house for me to live in when I got older. Karen, being Karen, wanted to sell it all and split the money. For years, they were at a stalemate. Mom lived in the main house with Dad and me, while the guest house sat empty. Karen would visit once in a blue moon, always complaining about how we were wasting an opportunity by not selling. Things came to a head when I turned 18. I had just graduated high school and was planning to go to the local community college while living at home. That's when Karen showed up out of the blue, all smiles and fake cheerfulness. Oh, sweetie, she said to me, her voice dripping with fake syrup. I've got such wonderful news for you. I've found a way for you to go to any college you want. I remember looking at her confused. What do you mean, Aunt Karen? I'm happy with my plans. She waved her hand dismissively. Nonsense. You don't want to waste your potential at some community college. I found some lovely people who want to buy this old place. With your share of the money, you could go to any university in the country. I felt my stomach drop. But Aunt Karen, this is our home. Mom and I don't want to sell. Her smile turned brittle. Well, it's not just your decision, is it? I own half of this property, and I say it's time to sell. That's when Mom walked in and all hell broke loose. They argued for hours, with Karen threatening legal action and Mom standing her ground. In the end, Karen stormed out, yelling that we'd be hearing from her lawyer. True to her word, a few weeks later we got served with papers. Karen was suing for partition, basically forcing a sale of the property. Mom was devastated and I was furious. We hired a lawyer, but he didn't sound too optimistic. Unfortunately, he explained, in partition cases the court usually sides with the party wanting to sell. Unless we can prove that keeping the property intact is somehow more valuable, we might be fighting an uphill battle. For months, we were stuck in legal limbo. Karen refused to budge, and the court seemed to be leaning her way. It was looking more and more like we'd lose our family home. Then, out of nowhere, Karen called Mom. She was practically gloating. I've found buyers, she said. A lovely couple who want to build their dream home. They're offering way above market value. You'd be crazy not to take this deal. Mom was torn. On one hand, she didn't want to sell. On the other, if we were going to be forced to sell anyway, at least this way we'd get a good price. After a lot of discussion and tears, we reluctantly agreed to the sale. The day we signed the papers was one of the worst of my life. Karen was there, looking smug as could be. The buyers, a well-dressed couple probably in their 40s, kept talking about their plans for the property. They were going to tear down both houses and build some massive mansion. I felt sick to my stomach. We had 60 days to move out. Those two months were a blur of packing, crying, and trying to find a new place to live. Mom was a wreck. Dad was angry but trying to hold it together for us, and I was just numb. The day before we were set to move out, I decided to take one last walk around the property. I wanted to say goodbye to all my favorite spots. The big oak tree I used to climb, the little stream at the back of the property, all of it. As I was walking near the property line, something caught my eye. There was an old stone marker half buried in the ground. I'd never noticed it before. Curious, I dug it out a bit to get a better look. 
What I saw made my heart race. It was a survey marker, but the numbers on it didn't match up with what I knew about our property lines. According to this marker, our property extended another 50 feet beyond where we thought the line was. I ran back to the house and showed mom and dad. They were skeptical at first, but the more we looked into it, the more it seemed like this old marker might be legitimate. We called our lawyer right away. He was cautiously optimistic. If this marker is accurate, it could change things, he said. The sale was for a specific piece of property with specific boundaries. If those boundaries are wrong, we might have grounds to contest the sale. We filed an emergency motion with the court, and things started happening fast. A survey team came out and confirmed that yes, our property was actually larger than we thought. The stone marker was legit. It dated back to when my great-grandparents first bought the land. The buyers were furious. They claimed we were trying to back out of the deal. Karen was even angrier, accusing us of making the whole thing up. But the evidence was clear. The property they thought they were buying wasn't the property we actually owned. The judge ordered a halt to the sale while everything got sorted out. It turns out that extra 50 feet made a big difference. It included a small wetland area that, under local laws, couldn't be developed. Suddenly, the buyer's plans for their massive mansion weren't looking so feasible. As the legal battle dragged on, Karen started to crack. She'd already spent the money she thought she was getting from the sale, and now it looked like that might not happen. In a moment of desperation, she tried to forge Mom's signature on some documents to push the sale through anyway. Big mistake. When we caught wind of what she'd done, we didn't hesitate to press charges. Forgery is a serious crime. And Karen found herself in way over her head. In the end, the sale fell through completely. The buyers backed out, not wanting to deal with the legal headache. Karen ended up pleading guilty to forgery charges. She got probation and a hefty fine. Plus, she had to pay back all the money she'd taken from the buyers. As for us, we got to keep our home. The court recognized that the property had been incorrectly described in all the legal documents, which invalidated the whole partition lawsuit. We ended up having to pay some legal fees, but it was worth it to keep our family land. The icing on the cake. That wetland area we discovered turned out to be a habitat for an endangered species of frog. We worked with a local conservation group to set up a protected area, which came with some nice tax benefits. Karen, last I heard, had to sell her fancy city apartment to pay off her debts. She's not speaking to any of us, which honestly is kind of a relief. As for me, I'm still living in the guest house, fixing it up bit by bit. Mom and Dad are in the main house, and we're all enjoying our family land. All of it, including those extra 50 feet, just like my grandparents would have wanted. It's funny how things work out sometimes. If Karen hadn't been so greedy, if she'd just been willing to work with us instead of against us, none of this would have happened. But her entitlement ended up being her downfall, and our salvation. I learned a lot from this whole experience, about family, about standing up for what's right, and about the importance of knowing exactly what you own. And every time I walk past that old stone marker, I say a little thank you to my great-grandparents for being so careful about marking their property lines. Who knew that a little piece of rock could end up saving our whole family legacy? The next one is a petty revenge story. My wife and I moved into a basement apartment. The family above us had four boys between ages four and nine. We actually enjoyed the occasional pitter patter from the boys upstairs and their gleeful laughing. Yes, there was the occasional game night that ran late, but we didn't mind. I would constantly be sharing food with them and they would occasionally send some cookies our way. The husband upstairs would constantly solicit my help with IT stuff because he's not a computer guy. Like when their router died and I offered to just replace the routers with my own that I had in storage. Everything was great between us and them, until it wasn't. It's important to note that the wife upstairs was the landlord's daughter. It's also important to note in our rental contract, we were guaranteed in point-blank no uncertain terms that we would get quiet enjoyment after 7 p.m. After a year passed by, the noises upstairs started getting significantly louder. The pitter-patters turned into stomps, crashes, and other loud bang noises. We noticed the parents were gone more often, leaving their 10Y kid in charge to babysit the other three. Our own little baby kept waking up in a panic due to the loud bangs and crashes at all hours of the day and night. We tried diplomacy and asking to tone down the noise. The more we asked them to keep it down with the stomping after 7pm, the more the wife seemed to retaliate and be rude. 
We even offered to pay for a contractor to come in and soundproof the flooring on our dime. Their response was, My daddy is the landlord, so he'll always take my side. If you don't stop complaining, I'll have my daddy kick you out. We had enough and decided to move. We sold them our BBQ grill since we wouldn't need it where we were going, and most importantly, sold them the routers they needed. They never asked to take over the Wi-Fi account, which is great, because I'll occasionally just block devices from working. Your little Wi-Fi toaster isn't working? Probably just a bad toaster. Your iPad isn't connecting to the internet? Maybe you need to restart it, etc. Nothing major, like their work computers or TVs, because that is too noticeable and would be blamed on the Wi-Fi, not the device itself. If they ever ask for help with it, my standard rates are $100 per hour, with an additional 50% a-hole tax. The next one is a malicious compliance story. Years ago, 1990s, I worked for an LGBTQ-themed coffee house in Hollywood, name redacted. There were two locations. One in Hollywood in an LGBTQ community center, and the second in West Hollywood. Both places were busy. My best friend Sumatra, 30F, and I, 30F, worked at both locations, and we loved it there. We made decent money, great tips, and made friends with most of our customers. One of the owners, Macchiato, didn't like female employees. He'd hire buff guys in their 20s he'd shamelessly flirt with, and then fire if they didn't reciprocate. The deal between the owners was that T ran the Hollywood location, and Macchiato ran the one in West Hollywood. Macchiato was a guy who loved to show off. He'd spend too much on supplies, expensive food, overpriced coffee beans, and would give raises to the employees he liked, the ones he hired. He'd also give his friends free coffee and sandwiches. The Hollywood location was consistently making a profit, while the West Hollywood location bled money. Eventually, the West Hollywood location closed, and the remaining employees were integrated with the employees at the Hollywood store. Macchiato started to hang around the remaining coffee house to supervise. His business partner T was on a three-month vacation in Europe when all this went down. Macchiato decided to hire his new BF, Espresso M18, as our manager. Espresso didn't know how a coffee house worked, and Sumatra and I were instructed to train him. He refused to learn anything, preferring to stay in the office or leave for three-hour lunches. Sumatra told me our days were numbered, and she was right. A week after Espresso was hired, he fired Sumatra fired for no reason, which left Espresso and myself as the only employees. Three days later, as I was getting ready for a film festival the community center was hosting, Espresso showed up with my final paycheck and told me I was being let go. When I asked why, he said there were complaints from customers. I asked him, as manager, why he didn't bring this to my attention earlier. Note, we had an employee manual that clearly spelled out a robust correction policy. He scoffed at me and took off. I then called Macchiato and asked him why I was being let go. He gave me the same lame answer. I read him the correction policy from the employee handbook, which pissed him off. It doesn't matter, Macchiato said. You're being let go immediately. You're clearly not barista material. I took a look at the two-block long line of film festival attendees who were waiting for the coffee house to open so they could buy drinks and snacks. I asked, Macchiato, if I'm being let go, who is going to help all the people who are lined up outside? He said, Oh, well, I'd appreciate it if you'd stay and finish your shift. I hung up the phone, opened the door, and told the line, We're open, help yourselves, and then left. I had my last paycheck, which didn't include the hours from my last shift, and since I clearly wasn't barista material, I didn't need to be there. I took my paycheck to a check cashing place, instead of depositing it into my bank account. That next week I got hired for an admin position with an accounting firm. I later found out from Sumatra that it was a good thing I cashed my paycheck instead of putting into my bank account as the owner of the check cashing place sent over two big dudes and made espresso give them all the cash from the register to cover the bad check Macchiato had written. The next one is an entitled people's story. My wife's Aunt Louise is a great lady. She and her husband lived in the SF Bay Area and bought their home in the late 1970s. After her husband passed, she sold her home for well over $1 million and moved back to live closer to her family where she grew up, farming areas in southern CA. She lives very frugally, so doesn't really have to worry about money. Aunt Louise had three children, who are now all in their 40s and early 50s. The two oldest are nice, normal people. Her youngest, Kay, is a real piece of work. She meets all the criteria for a psychological diagnosis of narcissism. Aunt Louise just turned 70. She's really happy about it. She had some health scares last year and decided to celebrate. She's a very kind and giving person, and celebrating to her means doing something nice for others. 
Aunt Louise has three children, 14 nieces and nephews, and 40 plus grandnieces and grandnephews. I don't know how much she sent to everyone, but based on what she sent to my wife, her niece, and knowing how much she likes to be fair, the nieces and nephews each received a check for $1,000. Based on what she sent to our kids, I suspect each grandniece and grandnephew received a check for $500. There was also a very kind and personalized note to each person saying how much she loved them and imploring them to do something fun with this money, don't pay bills with it. It was generous and sweet, and when a couple of the kids came by this weekend for a BBQ, we talked about Aunt Louise, their plans for the money. And as I suspect was Aunt Louise's intent, we had happy conversations about fun plans. Then the email came. For background, Aunt Louise's daughter Kay audits her mother's finances that would make the IRS blush. Last Christmas, she berated her mother for vacationing to NYC with a friend. Louise has always wanted to visit NYC at Christmas. She has frequently talked about plans for her inheritance with her still very much alive mother sitting right next to her. Kay sent my wife and others an email claiming that her mother is suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's with a request. More on that below. While we suspected this was Kay being Kay, my wife still called Aunt Louise, just in case. All of this was news to Aunt Louise, who was lucid as always. Here's the best part. In the email, Kay asked everybody to send the money they received from Aunt Louise to her, Kay, rather than Aunt Louise. Kay nobly volunteered to handle all the deposits herself to avoid being a burden on poor Aunt Louise, clearly too infirm to attend to such taxing matters. In light of the times that Kay has helped herself to Aunt Louise's money without permission, stealing is such an ugly word. I'm fairly convinced not a dime would make it way back into Aunt Louise. Thank you for watching, I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.